This is an introductory tutorial for the radiology of spine trauma. In today's tutorial, we will learn about the cervical spine and thoracic and lumbar spine. For the cervical spine, we'll understand the anatomy, an approach to cervical spine x-rays, specific upper cervical spine injuries, hyperextension injuries, and hyperflexion injuries. For the thoracic and lumbar spine, we'll talk about the three-column theory, as well as hyperflexion injuries and chance fractures. An imaging algorithm for cervical spine trauma is that the cervical spine should remain immobilized until the patient has been cleared, or until the extent of injury has been determined. Understanding the mechanism of injury is helpful for evaluating images and determining patient's prognosis. Patients with altered mental status, posterior midline tenderness, or neurological deficits undergo CT scans in addition to radiographs. CT scans have approximately a 100% sensitivity for detection of fractures compared with a 65% sensitivity for radiographs. Many institutions now recognize CT as the preferred initial imaging procedure in acute spinal trauma. MRI is superior to either CT or conventional radiographs in the evaluation of neural elements such as cord compression, cord edema or hemorrhage, and soft tissue structures such as ligamentous injury, prevertebral hemorrhage, and traumatic disc herniation. The following are indications for MRI in the setting of cervical spine trauma. First, if there is an unexpected level of neurologic injury above the level of radiographically seen injury, the presence of instability or progressive neurological deficits, signs of radiculopathy, myelopathy, or cord injury, patients with negative radiographs and suspected cervical ligamentous injury, and finally, widening slippage or rotational abnormalities of the cervical vertebrae suggesting soft tissue injury. First, it's very important to familiarize yourself with the basic anatomy seen on cervical spine x-rays. That includes the lateral, the AP, and the odontoid views. On the lateral view, some things to be aware of are the anterior arch of the C1 vertebral body, the predental space, which is the space between the anterior arch of C1 and the dens, the intervertebral disc spaces, the vertebral bodies themselves, the transverse processes, which project over the vertebral bodies, the spinous processes, the lamina, the pedicles, the inferior and superior articular processes, the atlanto-occipital joint, as well as the posterior arch of C1. Remember that when you're counting the vertebral bodies, the first fully formed vertebral body that you see is C2, not C1, so that's the best way to count. Remember that every lateral view should always include to at least the top of the T1 vertebral body. If the T1 vertebral body is not partially seen, then the exam is incomplete. And in that setting, sometimes a special view called a swimmer's view is performed. On the AP view, you can see the dens projecting over the mandible. You can also see the spinous processes. You can see the uncinate processes of the vertebral bodies, which are these pointy structures. You can see the transverse processes, the superior and inferior articular processes. You can see the pedicles, which are round. You can also see the medial aspects of the first few ribs. And remember again, when you're counting the vertebral bodies, that the first fully formed vertebral body you see is C2, not C1. On the odontoid view, you can see the teeth. You can also see the odontoid process very well. You can see the lateral masses of C1 and C2. As well, you can see the mandible, and you can see the body of the C2. You can also see the atlantoaxial joints. The atlantoaxial joint is also called the C1, C2 joints. C1 is also called the atlas, and C2 is also called the axis. In terms of an approach to every cervical spine x-ray, the upper cervical spine should be looked at separately, and this is the C1, C2 region. Next, the lower C-spine should be looked at separately, and this is the C3 to C7 region. And finally, you should make special attention to the prevertebral soft tissues.
Remember to always have an organized approach to every cervical spine x-ray. In terms of the upper cervical spine, it's very important to look at the C1-C2 relationship. The normal predental space is the space between the anterior arch of C1 and the anterior aspect of the dens. This is shown as the yellow bar. This space is less than 3 millimeters in adults and less than 5 millimeters in children. Always look at Harris's ring. This is a ring that's superimposed over C2 and it should be complete. If it's incomplete, suspect a fracture. In addition, the spinolaminar line should always intersect the opisthian. The opisthian is the bony protuberance at the base of the occipital bone. Also look at the Bayesian dental interval. This is the distance between the tip of the clivus, otherwise known as the Bayesian, and the tip of the dens. This interval should be less than 12 millimeters. Also look at the posterior axial line, and this is a line drawn along the posterior vertebral bodies, and this should be less than 12 millimeters from the tip of the Bayesian, shown here as the yellow line, which should be less than 12 millimeters. On the odontoid view, it's very important to look at the alignment of the lateral masses of C1 and C2. The lateral aspects of the lateral masses should have less than 1 to 2 millimeters of malalignment. In addition, the atlantodental spaces should be symmetric. When looking at the lower cervical spine, it's important to look for smooth contours of the following four lines. The anterior vertebral body line, the posterior vertebral body line, the articular pillars, and the span spinolaminar. In addition, the disc and interspinous spaces should be uniform at each level. When looking at the prevertebral soft tissues, the most important thing to look for is a focal contour abnormality. At the level of C2, the prevertebral soft tissue should be less than or equal to 7 millimeters in diameter. At the C3, C4 level, they should be less than or equal to 5 millimeters in diameter. And at the C6 level, they should be less than or equal to 22 millimeters in adults and 14 millimeters in children less than 15 years old. At the C5, 6 level, there's a natural slight increase in the size of the prevertebral soft tissues, which is normal because the esophagus starts in this region. The patterns of cervical spine injury are classified based on mechanism, and these include flexion, extension, axial loading, distraction, rotational, and complex mechanisms. The upper cervical spine is a very important region, and injuries here are considered very dangerous it's very important to pay close attention to this area. And some of these fractures include atlanto-occipital dislocations, Jefferson fractures, odontoid process fractures, and hangman's fractures. Atlanto-occipital dislocation is caused by severe flexion or extension of the upper cervical spine. It results in complete disruption of all the ligaments between the atlas and the occiput. It is highly unstable. The anterior translation of the skull on the vertebral column is the most common pattern. Death usually occurs immediately, and there is usually widening of the Bayesian dental interval and or the posterior axial line, which we just learned about. So here we see the posterior axial line and the Bayesian dental interval. If these are greater than 12 millimeters, be suspicious. Here's an example of a patient with atlanto-occipital dissociation. On the left, the C1-C2 relationship is normal, and on the right we can see that the entire head is dislocated anteriorly in relation to the C1-C2 vertebral bodies. The posterior axial line and Bayesian axion intervals are increased in this case. A Jefferson fracture occurs because of axial loading. 
These are fractures of the anterior and posterior arches of C1. This is considered an unstable fracture. There is lateral displacement of the lateral masses of C1 in relation to the lateral masses of C2 on the odontoid view. Widening of the predental space is also seen on the lateral view. Here's an example of a Jefferson fracture on the left. Note that there is widening of the lateral masses of C1 in relation to C2 on the odontoid view. On the right, note the normal relationship of the lateral masses of C1 in relation to C2. Odontoid process fractures occur because of hyperextension, hyperflexion, and or rotation. There are a number of different types. Type 1 is an avulsion at the tip of the dens. Type 2 is a fracture at the base of the dens. And type 3 is a fracture extending into the body of the axis, otherwise known as the body of the C2 vertebra. Types 1 and 3 are usually stable, but type 2 is highly unstable. Type 1 is also quite difficult to see on plane films because it's just an avulsion of the very tip. Here's a diagram outlining type 1, the tip of the odontoid process is fractured, type 2, the base of the odontoid process, and type 3 is a low fracture which includes the body of the C2 vertebra. At the top, we see a picture of a type 1 odontoid process fracture. At the right, we see a picture of the type 2 odontoid process fracture through the base of the dens, and in type 3, we see a fracture which extends into the body of the C2 vertebra. Note that in a type 3 odontoid fracture, there is disruption of Harris's ring, which we have previously talked about. A hangman's fracture is otherwise known as a traumatic spondylolisthesis of C2. The mechanism is hyperextension, and these are bilateral fractures through the pedicles of C2 in all three types of hangman's fracture. A type 1 is known as a typical hangman's fracture. These are bilateral fractures of the pedicles only. A type 2 is atypical, the fracture extends into the body of C2, and type 3 is associated with unilateral or bilateral facet dislocation. Types 1 and 2 are, tend to be stable, and type 3 is unstable. Of course, if any of these fractures are suspected on a plane radiograph, a CT scan is of course advised. Hyperflexion injuries are common injuries, especially with motor vehicle accidents. Clues include widened spinous processes, as we can see on this radiograph with the red arrow, kyphotic deformity, which we can see here with the yellow lines, as well as widening of the posterior aspect of the involved disc space, as we see with the green line. There may be an associated impaction fracture of an anterior vertebral body. Bilateral facet dislocation occurs with hyperflexion this is an unstable injury and is associated with anterior subluxation of greater than 50% of one vertebral body on another. We see the bow tie sign of the involved dislocated facets on the lateral view. As well, we see widening of the spinous processes and a focal kyphotic deformity. On the left, we have a radiograph of bilateral C56 facet dislocation. We can see that there is anterior subluxation of the C5 on C6 vertebral body. Also when we look at the posterior elements of the C5-6 level here, they look like a bow tie. This is called the bow tie sign. On the right, we have a normal radiograph. You can also get a unilateral facet dislocation, and the mechanism of this is hyperflexion with rotation. This is considered a stable injury. There is anterior subluxation of less than 50% of one vertebral body on another. You can see rotation of the vertebral bodies below in relation to the above the injury. As well, you can see lateral displacement of the spinous processes on the AP view. Here's an example of unilateral C4-5 facet dislocation on the left. We can see that the C4 vertebral body is anteriorly subluxed in relation to the C5 vertebral body, and there is an abnormality pertaining to the facets. However, we do not see the bow tie sign as we saw on the previous example of bilateral facet dislocation. On the AP view, on the left, note that there is right C45 facet dislocation. 
because the spinous processes are displaced. On the right, we have a normal cervical spine. With a hyperflexion sprain, there are widened spinous processes, as we can see in this radiograph with the red arrow. As well, there's a kyphotic deformity, which we can see with the yellow lines. You may have anterior displacement of one vertebral body on another. As well, you can see widening of the posterior aspect of the involved disc. This is considered unstable if there are greater than 110 degrees of angulation. A flexion teardrop fracture is a serious type of injury which occurs with flexion and compression. This is highly unstable. It is associated with severe spinal cord injury, most often the anterior cord syndrome. It is a compression fracture of the anteroinferior vertebral body, and you also see other signs of hyperflexion injury, as we've previously discussed. Here's an example of a flexion teardrop fracture. We can see a kyphotic deformity of the cervical spine on the radiograph on the left. As well, you can see a compression fracture of the anteroinferior aspect of the C5 vertebral body. On the right is the corresponding CT scan image. A clay shoveler's fracture is a fracture of the posterior aspect of a spinous process. This is most commonly the C7 or T1 spinous process. The mechanism is abrupt hyperflexion with lower cervical muscular contraction. This is considered a stable injury. Now we'll move on to hyperextension injuries. The clues to a hyperextension injury are widened anterior disc spaces, an anterior avulsion fracture of a vertebral body, and narrowing or impaction of the posterior element. An extension teardrop fracture is a type of unstable injury that occurs with extension. It is an avulsion of the anteroinferior vertebral body by the anterolongitudinal ligament. This is a result of forced extension. You may also see other signs of hyperextension injury. It can cause central cord syndrome. Here is an example on the right of a radiograph in a patient with an extension teardrop fracture. Hyperextension dislocation is a highly unstable injury that occurs with hyperextension. It is an avulsion fracture of the anterior aspect of the inferior end plate, along with a dislocation of the vertebral body. However, the dislocation is not seen with imaging because it usually reduces prior to imaging. The fragment is often wider than it is tall, as opposed to the extension teardrop fracture fragment, which is usually taller than wide. It is associated with severe spinal cord injury. However, of course, in this case, or any patient with severe neurological injury, requires a CT scan and or an MRI. A burst fracture results from an axial load. This results in decreased vertebral body height, as well as fractured posterior elements. You can even see retropulsion of bony fragments into the spinal canal. This is a very important sign, if you do see it, because these fragments can result in injury to the cervical spinal cord. Now we'll move on to thoracic and lumbar spine injuries very briefly. The three column model of Denis is a famous model of thoracic and lumbar spine injuries, which divides the spine into three columns, the anterior column, the middle column, and the posterior column. The anterior column includes the anterior two-thirds of the vertebral body, the middle column includes the posterior one-third of the vertebral body, and the posterior column includes the posterior elements. The injury is considered unstable if two or more of these columns are involved. Fractures or malalignment in a certain column imply specific soft tissue injuries. In the anterior column, these soft tissues include the anterior longitudinal ligament and anterior annulus. In the middle column, these soft tissues include the posterior annulus and the posterior longitudinal ligament. In the posterior column, these soft tissues include the posterior ligaments. Remember that we cannot see these specific ligaments and soft tissues on x-rays. We can only see the osseous structures. With a hyperflexion injury, the anterior vertebral body is compressed. These can be stable if only one column is involved, or they can be unstable if two or more columns are involved.
A chance fracture is a three-column injury where the fracture extends through the posterior elements. The fracture line has a horizontal orientation. This is of course considered unstable because it goes through all columns. You are now completed the introductory tutorial of cervical, thoracic, and lumbar spine trauma. You have reviewed the anatomy of the cervical spine, a general approach to cervical spine x-rays, specific upper cervical spine injuries to be aware of, hyperflexion and hyperextension injuries. In the thoracic and lumbar spine, we quickly reviewed the three-column theory, as well as hyperflexion injuries and chance fractures.